This is the first time I've created a video where I show you the complete process of sculpting a life-size sculpture. I'll show you everything from the beginning all the way to adding the clay on this fawn and even molding the piece when I'm finished. But I need to let you know, if you like the video, you have to give it a thumbs up and watch the video all the way through because if this video does not perform well, I am not going to make more videos like this. This took a lot of my time. It's a long video. Pause it if you have to come back. Comment too if you have anything to say about it. But that being said, let's get started on this life-size clay fawn. As the son of artists, I've been in the shop sculpting since I was about three years old. I created this channel to share some of my knowledge. From basics such as tools to more complicated techniques. So hit that subscribe button and join my channel to learn more about this unique and interesting form of art we call sculpture. Now you may not recognize it right now. This is the styrofoam core of a life-size fawn that I'm going to be sculpting. And this is a lot more complicated than what I've been working on lately, but I will show you different steps of the process. So let's get to it. Tools and materials used were high density foam, bandsaw, hot foam cutter, a filing rasp, permanent markers, masking tape, clamps, Gorilla Glue or foam glue also works well. JMAC Classic Plastiline Clay, Wire End Clay Rakes, Smoothing Tools, Clay Cutter and Putty Knives, Sculpting Wedge Tool, Tin for Molding, Two Part Silicon Rubber, Durabond Plaster, and finally a Drill. Whenever you're doing a big piece like this, I always need a lot of clay. This is high quality. So I'll be using a lot of this stuff and I'll be heating it up. So I'm just going to grab an extension cord and hook up this bandsaw. For those of you that do not have a bandsaw, I would highly recommend one. You can get smaller models than this too that just sit on the top of a table or a counter. Um, this is kind of tricky. So you want to be able to maneuver the foam or wood if you're ever cutting wood with a bandsaw around easily and you want to let the saw do the work. I'll adjust the saw um, that way there's not so much of the blade exposed. These are also very tricky getting in kind of corner areas. You'll see how I just make multiple cuts and then uh, break out the pieces. I did a little bit of sketching and thinking about how I want it to look and what size I want it to be. So here's the form, here's the head, this is the leg, and the ears will be pretty large, they have pretty big ears. So once that's all complete, I will go ahead and heat up this clay and then I can start to apply the clay to my foam here. This will serve as the armature. Okay, I don't need any wood or wire or anything like that. It's just a very simple piece that can sit outside in a garden. It could be indoors too, but it'll be a nice piece for any landscaping or gardens or flower beds, you know, things like that. So here I have my form clay. I came up with this idea because when I was a kid, I lived on an acreage. I would spend a lot of time out back. There was like a forest and a meadow and cornfields and all that. And one day I came across a sleeping fawn. And that's when I really realized how small these things were. He had all his spots on him. And I was a kid, you know, I just stood by him. I didn't try to pet him or anything. But he woke up, slowly looked at me, and then he realized it was a, it was a person. So he slowly got up and then he just trotted off into the trees. So. That's kind of where I got the idea for this. And uh, I think it'll be a great piece. It'll be a really good piece to put out in a garden or landscaping. Um, I'm pretty confident the way it's going to turn out. These larger sculptures though, are very extensive. You make sure everything works out appropriately. Uh, this one's gonna be pretty simple. 
since it just sits on the ground like that. But some of the larger pieces that are tall, um, I really need to think about how they support themselves and uh, what they'll be installed on. I'll begin adding the clay here in a second, but first I want to show you how I created the form for this piece. This isn't exactly safe bandsaw practice here. Usually I don't expose that much blade, but I had to cut out these ribs and give them kind of a beveled edge so that I could glue them around the sides of the fawn's back. This is week one, by the way. This piece took me a total of two months to complete working in the shop off and on. You can see here how I kind of trace out my pattern because I'm very meticulous when it comes to these forms. I really hate having to go back under the clay and cut through the styrofoam, so I want to get my cuts right the first time around. The biggest challenge for an artist is being able to envision the piece from the beginning and to be able to know every single step that you need to follow to make that sculpture come to life the way that you wanted it to from your first concept. I don't want to brag, but I do have a lot of experience shaping up foam forms. Sometimes I use the saw, other times I use the hot foam cutter. Uh, that's a really handy tool, but it creates a lot of toxic fumes. So sometimes the bandsaw is easier. I uh, also use a rasp, and I'll show you that here in a second, the way I rasp the edges of the foam and really give it that curved effect. You can see here I'm doing it with the saw, but that won't work on the larger piece of foam. Those cuts went pretty well. You can see that nice rounded edge there. That'll suffice for this form. Now that all the pieces are cut out, it's time to fit them together and finish off the top of the fawn's back. This is where the rasp will come into play, but first I want to trace out the uh, area that I want to chip away at. Now you can see the rasp there on the bottom of the screen, but first I use a knife with a serrated edge to cut away. That just saves me a lot of time and work and mess because this is a very messy job, as you will see here in a second. I like to keep my workspace clean when I can, but you know how it goes in an art studio. So over here I am uh, rasping the edges of that to give it that nice rounded feel on top. Uh, this does make a mess though, so have a trash can ready if you want to try this at home. Luckily my pieces all fit together just perfect. Now I just need to cut out a few more for the ridges of the back. I will also be cutting out a piece for the head too but that will be coming up here in a few minutes. Keep in mind what I said earlier about being able to envision the piece in its finished state while you're doing every step of the process. Cutting out the neck of the fawn was a lot more tricky than the other pieces. Uh, later in the video, you'll see how I actually had to go back in, pull back the clay and cut away at it with the hot foam cutter and I had to do a lot of adjustments in this piece. It's really hard to get that styrofoam just right. Uh, I could just take a huge block of clay, you know, and sculpt away at it, but the clay is so heavy and it's expensive. So I like to create my foam uh, core for the sculptures when I can. It's fun for me too, you know, it's just another step of this intriguing process when it comes to sculpting larger pieces. As I slowly cut away at these pieces, I'm just about ready to glue them together. I'll show you that here in a minute. Uh, you'll get to see how I not only glue the pieces together, but I use clamps too. That's a lot more professional approach because it just gives you such a stronger bond uh, for holding all these foam pieces together. That's not something I share with everyone, uh, like I said, this video is kind of a rare opportunity right now. That's why I was, uh, you know, saying, hey, uh, share the video, help it perform well, because these videos do take a lot of work on my part. You can't expect a guy to spend hours editing a long video if no one's going to watch it, you know. I can't tell you how happy I was when all these pieces fit together so nicely. 
Now that it's time to glue them together, I need to give the glue something to grip onto. First I trace out that spot, then I carve those cuts in the foam. That way the glue can kind of seep in there. The clamps will help out a lot with that, but you'll see how I do that here in a second. This glue is really good stuff. It's uh, actually, I think, oh no, this is wood glue, but I also use foam glue as well. Either one is very strong. I do have a link to that in the description. Like I said earlier, all the supplies are listed below. Now this masking tape isn't going to apply enough pressure to really give it that strong bond, but it will hold all of these pieces in place, giving that part of the foam something to grip onto as well. I'll apply just the right amount of this glue to make sure every part of the foam is uh, making contact with it and the other piece that it's being glued to. And now it's about time to start adding these clamps. Now if you have some experience with these, you'll know how handy they are. They do take a little bit of practice, especially when you're trying to hold pieces in place while you're uh, pinching the clamp together. That's why I use this masking tape. It just makes things go so much more smoothly. I'm really meticulous when it comes to uh, clamping my styrofoam together <laughs> because uh, I want it to have that strong bond that I keep talking about. That's why some of these weaker clamps that are smaller, I put those around the edge. But that larger middle piece, that's where I put most of the pressure. I just want to make sure that this thing is completely solid. Uh, because if I'm working around with it really aggressively with uh, hot clay, or even when the clay hardens, you know, I don't want any of that foam to break off. and I don't want it to move around. The finished product is all set up perfectly and ready to go once that glue dries. I usually give it at least 24 hours. I want all aspiring artists to know that you don't need to sculpt in clay. You can use this technique to carve foam sculptures out and cover them with fiberglass, resin, or whatever material you want. So you can use this almost anywhere. Looks great, and we are ready to go on to the next major step in this process. Now that our fawn should be dry, I'm going to take off all these clamps. Oh, man. When you run out of clamps, a great way to get the pieces to stay in place where you want them to is a thin screwdriver. I had some more here, I didn't use them though. So the clamp is the best option. I'll show you here how we, that's how I loosen them up. You know, and these things are adjustable. <clears throat> so you can, you can widen one end and then you can come down and pinch it like that. We're about ready to start adding some clay to the body. The head is going to be separate. So here's my pattern. There's the head, the ears. So it'll lay down there just like that. This JMAC Classic modeling clay is great stuff to work with. You can see how it's almost, uh, it's like mud, sort of, here. If you get it hot enough, it'll melt to liquid. That's why I like this stuff so much. It's oil-based clay. I don't need to mix it with any solvents or water to make it workable. Um, I just let it come to room temperature, and then it hardens, and that way I can carve in it, and it'll hold its detail. But right now, it's pretty soft, as you can see there. So I just need to accomplish the task of creating an even coating of the clay all the way around the form. And this is a lot more challenging than it looks. You know, it, I mean, it looks like I'm just playing a patty cake with this clay here <laughs> and just, uh, you know, spreading it around wherever I please. But really, I have to be very careful to make sure that that is a uh, even coating because once it starts to build up on one end or one area of the form, um, you just keep getting in the zone and you get carried away. 
while you're adding the clay, or at least I do. And then next thing I know, uh, one part of the body is way thicker than it needs to be, and I suddenly have distorted my sculpture. So I want to avoid that at all costs. As a disclaimer, the goal of this video is simply to show you the process of how I created this sculpture. I am not here to give you professional training on how to use the materials or tools that I mention in the video, but I will create some awareness for other professionals out there because it happens more times than you think uh, people do get injured um, that are in this industry and uh, a lot of things can go wrong. So I will bring up a few things uh, simply for awareness. As you watch me finish up adding the first layer of clay on this form, I want to bring up a safety precaution. And, <laughs> you know, I know a lot of people don't want to hear about that, but this clay is a lot different than like Sculpey or clays that you bake in the oven. Because you put this stuff in the oven, like I said, it will melt and uh, it can cause fires. If you're a beginner, you really should not try to melt the clay or soften it any way other than using your hands. Using those more industrial methods should be reserved for trained professionals only. So if you do choose to purchase some of this for the first time, you never have used plastiline modeling clay before or any oil-based clay, just keep that in mind. Um, if you heat it up, turn off the oven. If it gets too hot, uh, keep an eye on it really closely. Wear eye protection too. If it melts ever, wear protection for your hands. But I don't want to scare anyone, unless you're using some form of artificial heating, uh, it's not going to get that hot. So now I'm ready to apply clay to the top side of the form. I have the bottom all evened out, and uh, you probably saw back there how I was trying to get it all smooth so it lays flush on this surface here. Um, this clay here, I did use artificial means of heating it up so it is a little soupy it's not hot enough to burn me though but it's a little soupy and it's kind of sticky so i'm just letting it cool down while i uh, spread it around the top of that foam there and this foam is really great because when i used that rasp it gave the foam ability to grip onto the clay well If you remember back to when I was showing clips of cutting out that foam, I was talking about envisioning the piece throughout the whole process. Here you'll be able to see the neck uh, really start to show. So once I put that clay on, I'm just going to slowly build up that neck and I'll even form a little bit of a muscle structure. And think about the anatomy of a deer, or I mean a fawn, a baby deer that is, uh, that would be laying down. In about five minutes, you're going to see this thing really come to life, and you'll see that muscle structure start to show as I add the head, and I will actually carve out um, more foam with the hot foam cutter here in a second, because I need to create the legs, and I will create a little bit of a foam core for that head too. You'll even get to see me make those adjustments that I was talking about at the beginning of the video, where I will have to peel back some clay um, when I realized I had too much foam. Now pay attention closely as I use the palm of my hand to smooth out that clay. You saw just a moment ago how the clay looked kind of soupy. Well, it cools pretty quickly, and as I said, once it cools, it starts to harden. So the reason I want to do this, you can see me here using my palm to smooth that out as best I can. The reason I want to do this is because if you watched my cross-hatching video, You'll see that once that clay is completely hard at a room temperature, all of those bumps make it very difficult to smooth and work with. It's almost like the clay rake gets caught in those bumps and nicks on the clay. Right now, you know it's soft because the clay's not completely cooled down yet, but man, once those bumps show up and uh, the piece has been sitting there for a while, it is a huge pain in the butt to work with that. And yeah, if you notice me do that little weird thing with my wrist, it is kind of a workout. I sculpt a lot, but sometimes my thumbs and the muscles in my hands will get so sore from kneading the clay in my hands, just like you knead dough if you're making pizzas all day. 
And yes, I can see that spiral pattern showing up again in this piece, but this isn't going to be a Fibonacci fawn. By the way, for those of you that saw the Fibonacci Fox video, those are actually being cast right now by Jason the World Traveler. So I'm really looking forward to unboxing those here, hopefully in the next week. I featured his YouTube channel on my channel page, so feel free to check that out if you want to learn more about the process of casting these things in metal. And from what I understand, he works exclusively in bronze right now. So I go ahead and flip this thing over. I wanted to check the bottom just to make sure it's still flush with the surface beneath it. Uh, I want it to sit nicely, especially for when I mold it. And you're going to see that at the end of the video, how I mold this piece. I'll even be showing you how I made a sprue system for the ear on the fawn. My plan was to really give a lot of texture in the hair. Just not too much, though, to make it look really shaggy, but just give it that nice texture of a fuzzy fawn by adding enough clay here that I'll be able to carve into it and work with it with my clay rakes after it dries. You'll see that, too, when I uh, create different textures to give the impression of the hair on the deer. I've always felt there's a little bit of a battle between artists that prefer to work in realism and artists who are more interested in contemporary and abstract. I have to say that I love working in realism, but I am also fascinated with impressionism too. I think it's great practice for a painter, sculptor, or any artist to create things the way they perceive them. There have been many famous artists who received harsh criticism during their times alive when they were trying to get their careers going. And they would tell people, especially the critics, they'd look at them and they'd say, well, the sky, you may say it's not that color, but that's the way I perceive it. Or they'll say the grass doesn't look like that. And the artist will say, well, to me, that is the way I see the grass. And that's how I see it in my mind. So while sculpting this fawn, as with all of sculptures, I do need to follow a discipline, but I want to use a little bit of my artistic license to give it that texture and make it unique so that it allows your imagination to fill in some of the gaps and it allows you to perceive it in a certain way as well. And just for your information, this isn't the final texture that you're seeing right now. I'm just about done adding this primary coat of clay on the piece. Uh, here we're just about to get to the clips of footage where I'll be adding the head. And that'll be a little bit more interesting, I think, because you'll get to see how I create the legs and position them in a way that you can really see the fawn come together before I even have clay on the legs or the face. Another technique of visualization when creating something like a sculpture such as this is using shapes to your benefit. Um, you can see here how I'm kind of just forming the basic shapes of the fawn too. It's sort of like the spiral pattern in the Fibonacci fox. Sculpting the Fibonacci fox really helped me to remember that sometimes you'll see a pattern in something and it'll create an opportunity to make the piece even better. So that's what happened to me. I saw that pattern and I just wanted to go with the flow. Another way to describe that would be letting go and unleashing your creativity. The really tricky part here is keeping that hot clay from sticking to the palm of my hands. You can see it there, how it's stuck to my thumb. Uh, that'll make a little bit of a mess here. Now this clay, I've said it before in some of my previous videos, but you can get it in different consistencies of firmness. Uh, JMAT Classic, I think they do medium, firm, and soft. This is the soft version of the clay. So hopefully you're still watching and you're not bored yet because now we're going to really get into the good stuff where you get to see me carve that head out of foam, carve the legs, and then I actually pin all of it together. I just use T-pins to pin the foam in place. Then once I put that clay on, you know they're going to stick well. So here it is, the hot foam cutter in action. I'll let you just watch for a moment.
you can just see how easily that thing cuts through foam. All you do is hold the button down, it's like a trigger, and the thing heats up instantly, sending an electrical current through it so that it just slices right through that high density styrofoam. So here I'm pinning the legs in place, then I'm adding that clay, making some adjustments with that foam cutter. I have to be careful when I cut that foam out because I don't want to burn too much of the clay. I have to peel back as much of it as I can. Creating this ridge line along the back really helped guide me when I was trying to sculpt the anatomy and the muscle structure of the deer because he kind of had a leg that was lying beneath him. The head was very challenging too. That took a lot of reworking. So here you can see an up-close shot where I make an adjustment by cutting out some of that foam beneath the clay. I just hold that trigger down and the metal heats up. That I'll call it a blade, I guess. <laughs> Slices right through that foam. I do not recommend breathing in these fumes though. <laughs> so wear a mask if you have one of these at home. I really had to chip away at those pieces with these pliers. I don't know why it's more difficult than it looks, but you don't want to leave those pieces of foam in there because it gets caught in the clay. And, you know, I was talking about the clay rakes earlier getting caught on bumps and things when the clay hardens. Foam's worse. The last thing you want to do is be picking out little pieces of foam while you're creating the finishing touches on a sculpture. I did add a little bit too much clay on that head. It's a little too thick, especially on the brows there. But fawns have a rounded head, so that was the look I was going for. I wasn't able to get all of the footage on the details of sculpting the head because I had to work at it for a long time. At this point in the process, I think this would probably be at week three or four. Um, I was out of town, I had to come back and work on it, but this thing took me many hours in the studio. I really chopped it up here for this video. I'm going to go ahead and stop talking for a few minutes so you guys can just watch and I'll pick back up on the narration once I get to the texturing of the fur on the fawn and then right after that the detail work and finally the molding which will be a lot more technical. We'll get to that here in a minute.
I didn't get all the footage, but I actually had to go back and thin those ears out a little bit and make them very smooth. But uh, in the end, it was very nice. You'll see that here in just a second. We're just getting to the uh, finishing touches where you can actually see the deer completed. Then I'll even show you some photos of it in bronze. And uh, I was just uh, very pleased with the way it turned out. So very happy, but you'll see that here in a second. Right now the fawn's getting a little bit of an alien look and a lot of sculptures get this look and some artists don't uh, know how to fix it. Even human sculptures you'll see this and usually the reason for that uh, distortion is an enlarged head. The head is too large and it's too round. So you see me adding this clay um, to give that ridge there a uh, natural look on the nose. I'll actually have to cut down a lot of this material around the head, um, but this will give me something to carve into. You can see here I'm starting the texture on the fawn, and uh, this is where I really had to be careful not to give it too much texture, because once that texture and clay is in metal, it's really going to show a lot more than it does right now. So I want to keep it subtle. I don't want too much that it's sharp looking. I just want to give it an even, nice, flowing pattern. And uh, around this backside, this was kind of interesting too, because I had to kind of think about how the hair was going to lay while I was sculpting it. I use this modeling tool as a wedge. Um, it's referred to, though, as a modeling tool if you go to Sculpture House website or any other website. You get to see me use some other tools in action too on this part of the sculpture. If you bear with me for a second, the camera will come back and do better focus. I do say this all the time, but I do all of my filming and editing on my cell phone. <laughs> so I'm a little bit limited sometimes, but I get out videos the quickest that way. A simple putty knife is also an excellent tool in the studio. Um, it's really easy to just chop through clay, especially if I want to remove something or trim something down. It's a lot faster than getting that clay rake. You got to be careful with these clay rakes too because they break really easy. And this is a hardwood uh, wire end clay rake. And uh, these things are a little bit expensive. So if you haven't seen my video where I can show you how to make them last longer, be sure to check that out because it will save you a lot of money and a lot of headache. I really enjoy sculpting details in my sculptures. Now it is important to capture those details when I mold the pieces. You'll see here at the end of the video when I mold this fawn how I use silicon rubber and that rubber is like liquid because it will capture every single detail in this piece. Sculpting fur or hair is kind of like sculpting clothing. It can be very difficult sometimes because you really need to understand the nature of the material if it were in real life and not in clay. It's kind of like taking a hard, heavy material, which is the clay, and making it look light. The fur really has to give a sense of flow by laying down naturally. Being able to give the effect of hair it took a lot of practice and a lot of trial and error over the years, but I figured out a few techniques that I prefer. You can see how I kind of start from the top and slowly work my way down towards the bottom. I think of it as shingling a roof. Each shingle lays on top of one another, and it creates that pattern of layers. A lifelike bronze sculpture is not an ordinary garden installation. An outdoor sculpture like this is something that would last for thousands of years. And it has to look lifelike. It has to give that detail. And you can really see the quality come through in the metal and the patina. So I just have to invest a lot of time in a piece like this. It's kind of fun in the final stages to play around with the lighting and see the different effects it will create on the surface of the clay. 
because once that is cast in metal, it's really going to be pronounced. The shadows are a lot deeper, and the shiny parts really have a lot more brilliance to them, especially if the patina is done well. Bill out in Utah and Bart in Oregon are two guys that are some of the best patina artists I've ever known. They both have their different styles and strengths, as do all patina artists. Working as a team is really important for a foundry, and the artist really needs to be involved throughout the whole casting process. As a sculptor, I'm always learning more about the casting process. Around the back of the deer, I had to create a spot where the hair kind of falls down and lays against the ground. I just have to make it look like it settles there on the ground. And I have to keep the bottom of the sculpture flush. That way it sits flat on a smooth surface, such as a base. This sculpture will be featured in the uh, Mason City Sculptures on Parade Sculpture Walk this spring, May, and it will be there for all of 2018 and into 2019. So if you make your way through Iowa, don't forget to stop in Mason City to check out the Sculpture Walk. I'll put some links in the description below too if you want to check those out. You can see here how I used the wire end tool, the clay rake, to kind of round off the bottom of the fur there. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to capture all of the footage of sculpting the head. I think that should be reserved for a video in itself, though. There will be plenty more to come here in the future. I'm just about finished with this piece of adding the detail. You can see me using that smoothing tool. That is a very handy tool with that rubber. And there, uh, it's really easy to get into small details like that and smooth them out. Then you can see me adding the hair on top of the head. I just want to give it a slight impression of that fur like fawns have on the top of their rounded head. This is probably my favorite tool. It's a small wire end clay rake, but on the end it has that paddle which is for the uh, modeling. So it's like half modeling tool, half clay rake, and this thing is great for details. It's always interesting how you rough out a sculpture in clay and then you don't really see it, but once you add those details and really create that surface the way you want it, the sculpture seems to come to life. These hooves were the final touch for me. Once I had these finished, the sculpture was ready for molding. So, I am ready to show you all that footage right now. Molding is a very technical process, so you don't get to see this everywhere. Now that the piece is ready for molding, I'm going to go ahead and elevate it up in the air to make sure that rubber can get in every spot beneath it. Um, I'm going to make a sort of wall around the sculpture too, and that will contain the silicon rubber. That rubber is like liquid for the first layer until I use a thickener with it. So you will get to see all of that here in a minute, and you will get to see me use a sprue system for the left ear of the deer. If you want to learn more information about molding sculptures or how the casting process works, be sure to visit my website. I will put a link in the description below for that too. I have way more information on there if you want to check it out. And I do want to say once more, this video took a lot of my time. It took hours and hours to film and edit. It's very difficult to sculpt and do all this and film the process at the same time. Jason, I know you're watching, you know that. <laughs> so if you enjoy this video, I ask that you comment below, ask questions about what's going on, tell me what you think. If you really enjoy it, give it a thumbs up by clicking that like button because this video has to perform well. Otherwise, I'm probably not gonna spend hours of my time creating long videos like this. This is weeks and weeks of footage all condensed down into about 45 minutes. I have to be sure that this is a good mold and captures the detail because this will be probably a garden sculpture in the end and it really needs to be able to capture that sunlight properly. Uh, it needs to have a nice finish on the metal. The surface needs to look great. The patina needs to be perfect. 
So molding is very crucial. I would hate to spend all of that time and then lose the detail on my piece because it wasn't molded properly. So this is a great opportunity for you to see how I do that. Here you can see that wall is all set up. It almost looks like there's a moat that's going to be placed around the deer. And actually there kind of is with this rubber. So now you can watch me finish this molding part of the process. And this is the final step before I send the mold to the casting foundry. And uh, I am very lucky to work with great foundries and people who are true artists and experts in the industry. It's very difficult to get your sculpture transformed into bronze metal because of the lost wax process. So enjoy these last few moments of the video. I will have a few more things to say, but be sure to watch it all the way through because you're going to see the final steps and you'll get to see the piece completed in bronze metal. Before I let you watch the final few minutes of this video where you get to see me break off the shell and you get to see the piece finished in bronze, I want to thank Bart for creating such a beautiful patina and I want to thank Steve and his crew for getting this piece done so quickly. I especially want to thank all of you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that like button and share it with your friends. I hope you enjoy these last few minutes. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to Fritz Hoppy on YouTube.